I'm Megan Molden. I'm the Vice President of Training at Your Realty Leverage. We are a recruiting, training, coaching, consulting, and administrative services company for real estate agents and brokers. And every single week we do a webinar like this where we bring in people either inside or outside the industry to give the most value that we can to you. So today I have an awesome co-host. Um, we met, I don't know, maybe six months or so back while she was writing a book, which has now been published. And culture is a topic that came up and in our world, especially as we talk about recruiting and retaining culture's huge. Businesses and relationships, whatever it might be, they rise and they fall on it. So I'm really excited to learn from Rachel today. And I'm going to have you, Rachel, go ahead, take it away, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Um, and actually, oh, one more ground rule, use the chat. So if you guys have questions or anything as you go, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll keep an eye on them. Rachel will keep an eye on them. Um, and we will answer questions from there. So Rachel, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. I'm unmuted. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah, you're good. Good? Okay. Uh, yeah, so I I can't remember who it was connected me to Megan. I initially had thought I want to write a book on the intersection of culture, workplace culture, and customer service. And uh, Megan was one of the, the you know, upfront names that, that someone wanted me to talk to. And so, yeah, the book has been published. It's called Everyone is Not Like You creating authenticity and connection in today's workplace. So um, just a, a little bit about myself. I, my number one strength on StrengthsFinder is connectedness. Well, actually my number one is inputs, which I always am like, what? Who gets a number one strength of input? But anyways, my number one strength is input. My second strength is connectedness. So you can kind of say I'm hardwired for this culture conversation about how individuals come together to create um, a collective. My, my work history has really spanned all, all sorts of things, dental industry, government contracting. I did do a stint in commercial real estate as a chief culture officer of a, a small commercial real estate firm here in, in Kansas City. Um, but today, I would really like to talk about how you can leverage culture as a competitive advantage. So um, first of all, is anybody familiar? If, if you are familiar with StrengthsFinder and you know your number one strength, you might share that in the chat. Or if you have an assessment that you love, um, share that in the chat as well. What I love about assessments is that they give us language for things. And, and one of the kind of the essential pieces of workplace culture is a shared language, like being able to know the lingo. I mean, I'm sure you have people come in into your firms and they need to know the technical lingo but a lot of times we don't think about just the people lingo. Like how do we talk about people in a similar way um, that kind of levels the playing field? So um, I love assessments. I've done all sorts of them. Thank you for sharing, Megan. Um, so the impact on culture, uh, the impact of culture these days, let's see, I'm gonna share, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. For anyone who came in after the announcement, feel free to drop any questions or feedback in the chat. Rachel and I are both going to keep a keep an eye on the chat. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So let me move along here. The impact of culture. So I'm throwing some stats up on the screen. Um, just stats that that came through Gallup surveys. And I don't think it's gonna, it's a surprise to anybody that culture has a huge impact. I mean, it, it, you know, it even impacts service and people staying with your company um, over time. So culture has a huge impact, but I think more than anything these days, we, we feel it in, in hiring and retaining and in those conversations. So um, I'm currently serving as a leader of customer experience at a transition or a transportation and logistics company. And one of, one of the things that came through my desk was, okay, we gotta make these job descriptions reflect our culture. So, so people 
um, candidates are asking about what the culture is and we need to be able to tell them something. Um, and so it, it's all over the place. People are, are asking for it. It's becoming kind of a critical piece um, of, of business. And so, so I'm curious from you all, when you, when you think of culture related things, what, what keeps you up at night? So are there any things that you would tie back to culture that really kind of feel like pain points to you? So if you have any of those, put those in chat, um, in the chat, because we really want to, I want to make sure we touch on things that are super relevant um, to you all. But so if there's any, anything you want to share pain points around culture right now, put those in the chat. Um, so my my definition of culture is simply how, how we do things. And that's kind of the number one thing around this culture conversation is just having your own definition of what culture is. Um, some people say it's the beliefs and norms and values of everyone put together. Um, I like just to say it's how we do things because it's, it's how we do the exit interview. It's how we do heart, you know, have disagreements and conflicts inside inside the workplace. It's how we put out a job description. It's how we do um, a, a hiring interview. It's how sales and service talk to each other and the stories that we create about each other when we're not talking to each other. Like all of that to me is, is part of this culture conversation. And the thing about it is it's not one person setting the culture. Every one of us takes part in setting the culture um, in the office and in the company. So it's, and every person you add, adds something else um, to the culture, which is why hiring um, well is so important because every person you add, adds something to that culture. Um, and so you wanna do that very purposefully. So if you have a definition, <clears throat> I would invite you to share that definition in, in the chats, just when you think about culture, what, what is culture for you? Um, the other thing that's so important about really clearly defining culture for your company is that how do you measure and maximize something that's, that's gray and you don't know what it is? <clears throat> and that's to me when I was able just to have that simple definition of, of how we do things it now is something I can pay attention to, just how the interactions happen, how the work flows, all of that is culture, and we can start measuring and measuring that kind of thing. So when you get a sense of what that definition of culture is for you, I would ask you where you are in relation to that definition of culture. So if culture is norms and rituals, if you believe culture is, these are, these are the things that we do together and that's what culture is. So maybe culture is more like family um, to you. Where are you in relation to that definition of culture? Um, I think that measurement piece is what gets really fuzzy when we talk about culture because we're talking about things in the gray area and we're talking about um, you know soft things and not hard things. So we it's it's easy to to have met metrics and measurements around numbers, but how do we have metrics and measurements around culture? And this is where I believe it begins by being being very clear of what culture is and being very clear uh, where you are in relation to, to what you, you want your culture to be. So this, this is, and this is the big idea here, is that you're always sort of assessing that gap of where you're headed when it comes to your workplace culture and where you are currently. So, so one of the th things here in my role is that we're, we're a company in growth mode, probably like many of you, I would imagine with, with, the, uh, with the market as it is. Um, and so part of our culture is, you know, we need our culture to be scalable. We, we want things to be able to grow with us um, as we get bigger, add more people, have more revenue. And so being able to assess what that culture looks like down the road 
and keep um, defining and redefining it. And then really saying clearly, okay, here we are, here's where we are. So here's the big gap. Here's the gap. And what are all those things that are in between where we are now and where we're going? <clears throat> and once you do that work, you can then begin to prioritize where you're going to put, you know, where, where you're going to put your time, time and energy. Maybe things like, um, you know, how, how clear are the norms? I mean, a lot of times um, what is a, the big issue is that there's not a lot of clarity. Um, so it could be clarity on norms. It could be um, not understanding how people connect to other people. So it could be lines of communication that are not um, very clear. And that could be in your gap. And so you could start really looking at that. But ultimately, that gap is, is your gold mine. The gap is how you get from where you are um, to where you want to be in, in everything, but also in this, this culture conversation. So. When I think about the gap space, um, I it, it is such fertile ground and there's so much to kind of dig into. A lot of times in growing companies, in fact, I just had a conversation with one of our leaders this morning. We're moving quickly, we're moving people into positions they need to be on a regular basis. And sometimes what happens in all that hustle and bustle is that we forget about the people. Um, involved. So we forget to slow down and, and ask more questions. And so that's what I think um, can really be fruitful in this gap is to really slow down and begin to get curious and ask more questions. And then the other thing is just not to take on more than, you know, not take a bite so big you can't chew it. Um, this culture conversation is really big. So when I, if we go by my definition of culture is how you do things, we're all doing a lot of stuff all day long. So how do you kind of drill down and figure out what to pay attention to, where to put time and energy um, to have the biggest impact? So we'll get into a little bit of that, but my rule of thumb is never... You know, it's, it's funny that we use priority, you know, we're going to prioritize our list, except priority means one. But we talk about prioritizing like one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, you can only have one priority. So when you think about, you know, the, the action you want to take, um, I always think, okay, it cannot be more than three, three things. We, there's, it's impossible to, to have that really have three priorities, but if we need to have three, fine, that, that's the, the limit for me. And then to be really, especially when you're in a kind of a grow, growth environment, to be real flexible with your strategies when you start to do that, because it's, things change. I mean, the market changes um, quickly. And so to be, to be flexible and agile um, around your strategies, but to keep, keep them in front of you. So that was a lot blah, that I just, just gave you there. So I'm going to pause and just say, is there any, let's see, can I see the chat? I can't see the chat. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, all right. So I'm curious, um, again, something that share in the chat, if you're, you're willing to, but when you think about the culture gap in, in your office, what do you feel like is the, is the biggest gap? Is it communication? Is it clarity of roles? Um, is, it, is it clarity of direction? Um, is it that we don't have a definition for culture so we can't even determine what the gap is? But just make a note to yourself, and if you're willing to share it in the chat, awesome, but make a note to yourself um, just about what is one thing that you know is in your, your culture gap, All right? Uh, all right. So, so one of, you know, another idea just about this gap is that by defining first where you're going and what you want that culture to be down the road, whether it's a year, two years, three years down the road, 
that keeps you from doing, I mean, it's, it's always easy to, there's always tons of things to improve. Um, but, but really looking at it in this lens and I'm going to, I'm going to, um, If we look at it from this, this gap, so where we're, where we're going, where we are now, it keeps you focused on the improvements that really can make an impact. So a lot of times, I mean, we're fire, a lot of us are firefighters throughout the day. Um, I think oh, that gets, I'll get on a soapbox when we are firefighting all day long, because we're really just, we're really just a duck on the water with our feet, you know, going. Firefighting doesn't really get us ahead. It just gets us to, you know, zero. And so really looking intentionally about where you want to go with your culture, where you are now and what's in that gap will keep, it will be less firefighting and more intentional improvements. All right. If you, Megan, if there's anything that you ever want to bounce off and add, just don't, I mean, you're welcome to do that. Okay. All right. All right. So I want to move into um, really three ways that I feel like you can maximize your culture right now. Um, some of this is really just mindset. Some of this is clarity. Um, but there, there's three ways that I think are just like low, low hanging fruit which I'm, so I am, let's see, I'm two months in, no, not even two months. I'm a, a month and a week into this new role. And it's interesting to see the, these are as a direct, ex, my experience over the last month and a week being inside in a new, new organization. So the number one way, if you do nothing else after this hour together, if you pay attention, to culture, um, you will maximize it. So I don't know if anybody's heard of that, where, where your focus goes, energy flows. Another way to say it is what you focus on expands. And so if you put little bits of effort into defining culture, Sarah, I love whoever's doing calisthenics behind you. That is fantastic. Just noticing a little calisthenics going on. Um, anywho, where you're, See, like that, that's an example where your attention goes, energy flows that, that direction. So our, our attention is our number one resource. I know a lot of times people say time is our number one resource, but we can waste a lot of time. Um, it's when we're present and really, you know, attending to the time that we're in that makes that time super valuable. So when you really start to put some attention into this, like, what is our culture and how do we want to define it and communicate it? Um, you will notice more energy. You'll just notice more uh, going on. So one of the, the key things around this paying attention is to, to clarify your North Star and, and what I consider a North Star. And there is no right or wrong way to do this. Um, there are lots of different paths you can take. I mean, there's, you know, your core or, um, you know, just even your why statement. Simon Sinek has a whole, whole fortune amassed on just start with why. Um, but really clarifying, clarifying something like this. So I consider your North Star to be your vision of success, your purpose or mission, whatever you know, feels right, or, and your values or principles. And so if you can work on paying attention to these three things, um, I think it, it really, the energy starts flowing and you start clarifying and, and discovering um, where you're headed and where you are. So for example, I stepped into this company and we have five company values up on the wall. They're up on the wall. Nobody ever talks about them, really, but they are up on, on the wall. And so one of the things that I'm working to do is to bring those values into conversations to just see, are they even really 
um, are they really our values or were they a nice marketing effort um, by somebody before me? So a lot of times this North Star is put in place from a marketing lens where it really needs to be a collaborative work of, of, of everybody. Because remember, everybody adds to the culture. Even those people that it's like nails on a chalkboard to have around, they too add to the culture. And so finding, I mean, the, the thing about the North Star, what the North Star does is it gives you, it gives you measurement. So if you can define your vision of success, you know if you're moving in the right direction. If you can define your purpose, you know on a day-to-day -day basis if you're spending energy in the right way. If you define your values, then you start to be able to say, okay, this behavior does not fit into our values. So either you know, we need to do some adjustment to the behavior or is this really our values? I mean, if this is how we're gonna operate, then maybe this is not our value. So, so these really provide measurement for you in something that's kind of gray, right? Um, so I thought we could do a quick little values exercise that actually my husband did with me last night over the phone and it took just a few minutes. So generally when I do values, I'll do a whole, you know, give a whole sheet of, you know, 200 words and have you see, you know, circle the ones, you know, 20 that really jump out at you and then narrow that 20 down um, at a time. And the thing with values, I, I feel like values are easiest for me to start with, but you may find a different, you know, it may be easier for you and your company to define purpose first, um, but values just seems to flow easier. Although my personal story is values were my last thing to come up with because I thought they had to be set in stone. And um, in fact, no, they change on the regular. So these, these all should be held really flexible, just like that gap strategy. Um, these should be revisited annually to see if they in fact <clears throat> are still the right, you know, the right alignment tools. So, okay, so here's the values exercise. I want you each to real quick, just jot down the three best moments of your life, three highlights of your whole life. Just the first three things that came, came up for you. When he asked me this last night, I said, well, I have three children. So there you go. And he was like, well, that's one. <laughs> okay, I had to go with more. So mine were my children, um, a program I went through that was very transformative. Um, and then of course I felt like I had to say marrying him. I mean, what, what was I to do? Like I, <laughs> he was asking the question. Um, all right, so once you have your three highlights down, I want you to think about for each of those things, what were you feeling? What's the feeling associated with that highlight? So what were you feeling with that highlight? So for me, I this transform, transformational program I went through, it was definitely love. Um, with my three kids, birth my three kids, joy was the first thing that came to mind. And then uh, when I married my husband, I felt hopeful. Like, oh, maybe, maybe marriage can work. Uh, so um, love, hope, and joy were the three feelings that, that I came away with, which could be considered three values. So the thing with these values is you know, a lot of, and, and with purpose and vision of success, we end up not doing it because we feel like it needs to be perfect or it needs to fit a certain mold or, you know, and it's really, this is all an experiment meant to help you align toward, toward something, right? Toward the ideal future. So just playing with, with those values and you can even say, okay, so if I took hope as one of my values and I I drill down. You values can be words. I, you know, when I consult with companies, generally I'm like, give me your three, your three primary values um, as three words. 
but a lot of times people have three, three phrases, you know, um, that work for them. I mean, these values and principles can look like whatever works for you with the goal of aligning uh, behavior. So did everybody, and if you, if you share, thank you, Megan, for sharing joy at the top of your list. So if you're willing to share some of those values, that's awesome. Um, but it can be, you know, even having a team meeting and doing that exercise and everybody writes down on the board their three words, their three feelings, um, you start to see some, some collaboration and synergy around what your real values might be instead of just picking, you know, picking some that you wish were for your values. Um, so. All right, let me make sure I covered anything else. Okay, I wanted to there. The second part in this maximizing culture through paying attention is that these things have to be defined and redefined over and over. So you want this North Star, so the vision of success, the, the purpose or mission and the values and principles, you want those things to affect behaviors you want them to affect processes and communication. I know somebody said one of the big things in the gap was communication. So exactly why you have values is so that you can use that to hone in and set the standard for communication. So, so one of our values here at FLI is remember the human, which I love and it's even on my door. I get the remember the human door and I love it. Um, but I keep bringing that up because how we communicate with each other a lot of times is not remembering the human. You know, we're, we are creating stories about each other or we're assuming the worst. Um, and so we're not like compassion, grace, any of that is not part of how we're communicating. So in our next fiscal year, my theme for the year is remembering the human. And we're going to start with some communication training, some basic communication training so people can understand how we all communicate differently. Um, I mean, I have a thing about that. Obviously, if I wrote a book called Everyone Is Not Like You, I want people to understand we are all different and uh, there's a lot of value in that. So that's just an example of you want some of the, these pieces of your North Star to impact these three things and be a measurement to how you're doing these three things, how people are behaving. So one of the things that um, I typically like to do, and I did at the commercial real estate firm that I, I mentioned, is we came up with three values. I think it was uh, collaboration, resourcefulness. I don't remember the next one, but um, we put three to five behaviors to each of those values. So this is what it looks like when people are operating in this value. And then we also put three to five kind of anti-behaviors. Like these, these are things that, these are behaviors that are not aligned. So just to help people kind of get into that assessment of we're using these values as a measurement system. Um, so, so finding ways like that to really make these things tangible is really helpful in moving your culture into um, kind of that, that ideal place. All right. Okay. If you have any questions, feel free to throw them up in the chat. So my number two way to maximize culture is to prioritize it. <clears throat> so we, there's a lot of things that get in the way of this, but you, I mean, we all know the, the, um, who's the guy, Stephen Covey, <laughs> was that who came up with the rocks, the big rocks and the pebbles on the sand. Um, but you have time, you have, you, we all have the same amount of time um, and you do have time for the important things. And so prioritizing well is, is really important. And what I have found are some, you know, Megan mentioned the book. I did, I did 50 plus interviews for this book. And one of, one of the things that I recognized is that in, grow, in growing companies, well, not just in growing companies, pretty much humanity, um, we have a real problem with busyness. 
And so we end up getting so busy, we don't prioritize the most important things. Um, it's back to that firefighting mentality. Like I just got to knock all this stuff out. Who, who even cares? You know, it may not even be important stuff to do anyways, but it's part of just the, the standard procedure firefighting. And so busyness, I found to be a huge issue to moving culture and customer service forward. Um, the second thing I found was the whole do as I say, not as I do. I don't know if anybody's run into that before. <laughs> that um, is an integrity issue. Um, and I think that's why it's important to collaborate on North Star things like values and purpose and vision, because um, when everybody participates and everybody's accountable to it. Um, and people want accountability all the time, but accountability can only happen um, when there's clarity. It's very hard to hold people accountable when, when they don't know. It's a big issue I'm running into right now with the, with the whole sales and service. Don't you love the sales and service hiccups? Um, those folks are so cute together, aren't they? Um, but it's really because there's not a lot of clarity. You know, I mean, there's, there's probably more clarity internally, but our salespeople are dispersed all over and they don't know everything that's going on. They don't know all the little movements. And so they make choices and make comments based on what was happening pre-COVID. Um, because they just don't know what's going on. So accountability is only possible if, if there is, is clarity. Um, so do as I say, not as I do. One big reason why we have a hard time prioritizing. Busyness is another and fear is a third. We are just freaking scared to stop. Um, and because who knows what will happen? Maybe something different for all of us. Um, but a lot of times we don't stop because we're scared to for a number of reasons. And whether that's, you know, losing business or recognizing that, you know, you really are overwhelmed or that you just don't feel like you're enough. Um, there's all sorts of fears related to stopping and to prioritize well, you have to stop. You have to cultivate some, some space um, so you know how to prioritize. Um, so two two things that I would offer in this space of, of prioritizing well. Um, one is to seek input. So one of, one of my um, soapbox things is listening. I just think it's a shame that we're never really taught to listen well, um, but we're not taught to listen well. We're taught to to uh, speak and write um, and debate and uh, summarize and all sorts of things, but we're not really taught to listen. Um, and listening is, is, a, is such a key piece of healthy workplace culture. Um, so I'll ask you this, what, how many words per minute, pop, pop it up in the chat, how many words per minute do you think we speak on average? Give me a number or a range. How many words per minute? Megan says 100. Any other guesses? 120. Those are pretty close together. Any way out there guesses? No? That's hard. <laughs> I was like, hmm, how many words can I say? <laughs> I know. Some people are like, well, I can type this many words, so it's got to be at least. Um, so I, I have read anywhere from 150 to 200, 250 words per minute, Yeah, you know, depending on all sorts of things. So 150 to 250 words per minute. How many words per minute do you think our brains can comprehend? 50. <laughs> Other guesses? Anybody say more? 20. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yes, I've gotten even like seven. Um, actually, our brains can understand two to four times that. 
So that's why you can speed up a podcast or a video is because you can, your brain can comprehend a, a lot more words. Um, <laughs> it depends if I pay attention. Back to maximizing step number one, pay attention. Right, so your brains can comprehend um, a lot of words per minute, and that's just the words per minute. There's a lot more stimuli that you're picking up moment by moment than just words, right? You're you're reading body language, you're taking in, you know, sensory information from around you. There's a lot more going on than just that. So you can tack on another two times that in the amount of stimuli you can take on in any given minute. So listening is really an exercise in focusing. I mean, Tamar has it exactly right. Listening is an exercise in paying attention. It's not that I don't have enough information. It's that there's so much, I don't know what to focus on. So when you think about prioritizing, that's why I'm saying you have to cultivate this ability to stop so that you can prioritize. And seeking input is, is a big part of that. So, you know, asking, asking more questions, asking why. I think that's a, a lot of what I'm finding here in our, our rapidly growing environment is that people just, they, they take the first answer and they run with it because we're all moving so fast instead of stopping to say, hey, hold on, why is that important? <laughs> why are we doing that anyways? Is that, is that scalable? Is that gonna get us to where we wanna go? Um, does that honor our values that are up on the wall that everybody's looking at? Um, and so really seeking input is, is really in, an important part of prioritizing um, and, and cultivating kind of a little bit slower. One of my favorite quotes from my book interviews was um, a CEO here in Kansas City. And he said, you gotta slow down to go fast. And I just love, I mean, I just almost have that as a mantra of <laughs> like, we, we have to slow down to go fast because we can go fast and actually we're gonna go a lot slower on the, in fact, we're doing that a lot. Re-communicating, over-communicating, you know, fixing, solving problems that never would have happened um, had we slowed down a little bit and just, you know, measure twice, cut once. Um, so another thing about this, I, I'll move on to the communicate and, and re-communicate, but another thing about this prioritizing piece is that our priorities change regularly, right? So we, we at any given moment of the day can have a different priority than we had five minutes ago or an hour ago at the beginning of the day. And so being able to read really quickly uh, what the priority is so what I use for that are the four communication channels. And if you, if you are, have done any assessments like me, which I'm an assessment geek, um, you've, I mean, it's the disc, there's an animal game, there's all sorts of things that have these four different quadrants. Um, and so when I think about communication, I think about four communication channels. And those four channels are driver, social, lover and thinker, okay? And so each one of those channels has their own little avatar. Like you know how they act. Drivers are intense. They pay, you know, they pretty much pay by the words. I have one of our leaders here, she's a driver. And you, when she talks, everybody listens because she hasn't said anything. And then all of a sudden it's like one sentence. It's like, whoa. Um, but a lot of times they're read as angry because they're just so passionate and intense about getting from A to B because what's most important to a driver are results. So when they go to seek input, it's gonna be results oriented. They're gonna miss a lot of information because they're only looking to identify what is B in the A to B equation, and they miss a lot of the nuanced things that they could gather. So social folks are the big energy, social and drivers both have a lot of energy, but social people, it's way spread out. You know, they're the starters, not the finishers. They're the ones you wanna to go to the bar with and sing karaoke. Um, but a lot of times they don't wrap anything up and they definitely forget to dot their I's and cross their T's. Um, but they're driven by fun and attention. 
you know, and we need a lot of times that's what culture is kind of encapsulated in is that culture is fun, you know, and it's the social thing, but it's not, it's hard, it's results. Um, but if a social person goes to seek input, they're going to miss a ton of stuff because both of those people, both drivers and social people are really looking more at the big picture. You know? So then you have lovers which lovers will talk slower, they'll use more detail. When you're thinking about seeking input, you would wanna be probably on a social channel um, because you're gonna think, you're gonna listen for like, what's connecting? What does this person want? What's gonna make this person feel comfortable and come alive? I mean, it's a lot more other focused because social folks are driven by, by, by peace and connection. So they, they're gonna seek input because they wanna connect, they wanna know you better, right? Then the fourth, so there's social, so there's driver, social, lover, and the fourth is a thinker. Thinkers are also great at seeking input because they're all about data and perfection. So the more that I can ask you, the more data I can draw out of you, um, the better I feel. Right? And thinkers, thinkers are the slowest. Thinkers, though, if you're asking them for input, you want to ask them in advance and give them time to, count, you know, write down, think about it and spend some time with it and write it down. You don't, if you drop it on them, you'll be waiting a few minutes before they get all their thoughts together um, until they'll actually speak it out loud. So even the seeking input thing can be challenging because you're dealing with people and doing that intentionally and on purpose is so, so important. Um, so the, the second part of this prioritize is really communicating and recommunicating. I mean, you all know, like you gotta see something at least seven times and then probably more to know it. And I think a lot of times, you know, just <clears throat> the example here, we have these great values up on the wall, but. They were rolled out and I don't think they were ever implemented in anything that we did. Um, and so they need to be communicated and they need to be recommunicated and aligning to those, those sorts of things takes, takes time and it takes effort by everyone. So, all right. So we've got number one was pay attention. Number two was prioritize. And the third way to maximize culture is to invest. So actions do speak louder than words. This is exactly why values on the wall don't work because they're not an investment. They're a marketing ploy, or ploy sounds harsh, but anyway. Um, it is really about living, if you are going to live, if, if you are going to take culture seriously and, you know, cultivate some of your North Star, if you don't have friction around values and purpose, then you're not actually doing it. Um, some of the best examples, I think there's a couple that, that come to mind just right off the bat. There, there's a technology company called Basecamp who I think it was, it was in the midst of COVID had a big upheaval, like half their company left. And <clears throat> it, but you know what? They were living, they were obviously living by values because people felt so strongly about changes and what they said they believed in that they left. Um, so if, if there's not some, say, I think Google's another one that, you know, there's always hubbub about how things are done at Google because I think they probably really do take value seriously. So, you know, it's not smooth. The, the thing is, we talk a lot here about opening up cans of worms. Oh, I always, I, I love to open up cans of worms. Not everybody loves that. Um, but, you know, the, these conversations around culture are meant to open up cans of worms because the worms are all over. Um, so let's talk about them and get, because that's all, I mean, not talking about it creates a huge drag in, in relationships and workflow and, and success, honestly. So my musings about how to invest, um, because really investment keeps it top of mind, right? If you are paying for coaching, 
you're going to take the most. You're going to leverage your coaching well. If you're paying for, you know, Megan for recruiting services, you're going to be in bed. I mean, there's just when you put money into something, it it there's an investment and it keeps it top of mind for you. And so that's what when I say invest, I think investing in your culture helps you keep it top of mind. So here are a few ideas. One is just to spend time on it, right? So talking about values and purpose and vision in meetings. One of my favorite questions and a lot of times where I start with people is what, what, how do you define success? How do you define it for yourself? How do you define it? That was one of the questions I asked everybody when I was stepping into this role. What, what does success look like in this role? Because I couldn't really get my hands on what exactly it was. So just give me what success is so I can understand where we're headed. Um, but spe spending time in meetings, not just with tactical things, but really bringing some of these culture conversations in are really important. And also in performance conversations, I think it's a huge missed opportunity if you do performance evaluations to not include, I mean, if you have values, not include, you know, an a, a evaluation of how are you living into our values? Um, so really kind of putting this stuff in real time keeps investing in it. Um, another way is, is just is support. So clarity is, is number one, um, because you can't have accountability then without clarity. So clarifying over and over. And I think integrity is a, it, it, I don't know if anybody has the value of integrity. I've realized how important that value is to me since I, I wrote the book last year. Um, and it, it is one of our values here is integrity. Um, and a lot of people have that, uh, companies have that. But really it's, an, it's interesting how, when we don't talk about culture on the regular, how that breaks down integrity. So integrity is really about living by your values. And so if you're not clear on what your own values are, if the company's not clear on what their values are, integrity becomes a really slippery slope. Like, can you be integrated if you don't have that clarity? Um, and then ultimately connection. I think one of that's what is why culture is so important to me because one of my kind of deep down missions in life is to eradicate loneliness. And I think when we spend time on culture within companies, that leads to connection. Um, and our companies provide such a, an awesome platform to eradicate loneliness because we're, you know, a lot of times we're coming together every day. And how could someone be lonely when like I have 10 people outside my door? It just seems crazy. So um, culture can really lead to connection and really investing in culture can, can help people feel connected. Um, and the third, the third thing is just resources. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, in this work, we forget, forget the equipping part, which is what I love about Megan. And I think that's, we bonded on, on some of that. Um, of if you say, okay, our, our three values, I mean, if I just went out today and said my, the three values for my team are hope, love, and, um, joy. Um, but, but people aren't necessarily, I mean, I can assume that they know how to experience those emotions, but they may not be equipped to, or it may look different than mine. So, so spending time on equipping people to understand what you're talking about to tap into their own experience of what, what the values are and bring that to the table um, are really helpful. And then of course, coaching. I think it's, you know, it's, it's another thing that uh, I think coaching is taught more than listening um, and people fall into coaching quite a bit, but really, really fine tuning coaching skills is I think a, a key piece of, of culture development. And, and then finally networking. It's great to hear stories of what other people are doing um, and share, share that with each other. So, so that is, um, yeah, I think that's, let's see, is that my last slide? Oh, one more, one more slide. Measurements. 
Um, so I just, I wanted to leave this. I'm gonna, I told Megan, I will, I'll give her a copy of this deck and she can share it with you all. So you have some of these questions down, but this, this is the beginning of measuring the gray area of culture, you know, is, is to really identify what's in the gap. So, so if, if it is communication, saying, okay, communication is our number one priority in the gap when it comes to culture. And then kind of find it, like, what are, what are the three KPIs for communication? You know, is it, is it um, language? You know, do we need language? Is that one? Is it making time for a relationship? Is that another thing? Is it how, how information is disseminated? I mean, that could be the three KPIs. So then you can start to think about how, how are we going to measure those three KPIs? And now you have a measurement for culture. Um, so that I just wanted to give you those ideas on how to, how to really come up with ways to track progress, because I think that's really, really important because culture work takes time um, and effort. And sometimes it's placed on one person, which is impossible because we all participate. But there does have to be someone driving kind of this conversation and getting people engaged and understanding. So, so that, look at that. I'm so impressed with my timing. Um, I would love to hear back um, just what, what you're taking away. So if you want to, if you want to pop off your mute and share, or if you want to share it in um, the chat, maybe you choose one of these, either an aha or one thing you want to put in action, um, or one thing that's kind of wet your whistle and you want to hear a little bit more about. I would love that feedback for me so that I know moving forward what, what captures people. I'll kick us off real quick, Rachel. And one of the things you mentioned kind of, you know, surveying your team and getting some feedback from them. And when we talk about the values, when I took NLP in October of last year, um, for those of you who don't know what it is, neuro-linguistic programming, it was the craziest, coolest thing I've probably ever experienced, um, like mindset wise. But they talked about how words only have the meaning that we give them. So if I say that my top value is joy and you say your top value is joy, that's not the textbook definition of joy. It's what does it mean to you and what does it mean to me? So even going above and beyond those words on the paper, right? We put them up and they're for marketing. Make sure you know when you ask someone what does culture look like to them and they say communication or clarity, go even deeper and what is communication and clarity? look like and mean to them because that was a big game changer for me is knowing my definition of one word is not the same as everyone on my team so that was you know nice to hear here here in this conversation um, yeah. just to to survey everyone but go deep with it that's great I love that because that you know that difference between the words that we use and what's going on in our head like all of that um we fill in so many gaps just because we have to throughout the day that we, yeah, miss so much valuable information. So much valuable information. Yeah. Oh. yeah. What else do you guys have? Chat box or unmute. Give us some ahas, some okay. questions. Sarah, what'd you take away? Anybody? Here we go. <laughs> and you will get the replay. So for those how of to, you- How to get buy-ins from high Ds who don't right. <laughs> find value in anything. Well, I mean, I think, so this is an example of my point about Ds do, will find the value in culture if it has to do with results. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's framing it as it's not, it's not a social activity. This isn't about fun. This is about eliminating drag. Um, this is about getting from A to B faster than ever and more productive and successful than ever. Um, I mean, that's that's where I would go. We are currently actually the standard. Yeah. And I know it takes baby steps, like hard convers. Everybody's, I mean, back to the equipping thing, not everybody is equipped for a hard conversation, which is why this stuff takes a lot of time. 
Like you have to be slowly equipping people and like planting seeds, um, getting that buy-in over time. And, and then it just, it's, it's more of an evolution than it is a, just putting something in place. Yeah. And think about it too. It's, it's the difference between logic and emotion. So those high D's are generally mm-hmm. going to lean toward the logical side of it. And it's hard to make culture logical sometimes. And when we know that people leave companies and organizations all the time because of the culture, just like they join it, you can put numbers behind culture. You yes. absolutely can. So find what is it appeal that appeals to you as that high D or your people, um, your leader. Find the logic behind it. It's there for sure. Well, and I would tack on to that, Megan. I'll I'll, I'll remember too when you when you send the recording out to include. I have a, just a business case little mm-hmm. thing I put together. But before I would even use the business case with anybody. It, regardless of what they're high in, I would ask them what success is. Yeah. Because I don't know how to fit culture into what you're doing unless I know what you're doing. <laughs> so um, if, if I know what success is to you, then I know how to get you bought into what yeah. I, how I think it needs to go. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any other questions, ahas, or something that you want to learn a little bit more about? And if not, then Rachel, will you tell us how people can get in contact with you? Again, this is going to go out to a whole lot more people too. They may watch this back and then think about, oh, I have some questions there. I'd like to get in touch with her. How would they do that? Yeah. So you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Rachel Lacer Keck on LinkedIn. You can also email me at Rachel, it's R-A-C-H-E-L at mosaic-collaborative.com. Um, those are probably the, the best ways to get a hold of me. Yeah. yeah. So as you guys watch this back, if questions pop up or ahas, whatever they might be, send them over to Rachel, give her some feedback. Um, I thought this was great. Culture is a huge part of what our team talks about day to day and how we want to serve other people. And I know that just based on some of the familiar faces I saw today, I know what's going on in some of their organizations and how important culture is right now in this moment. So I think a lot of people are going to take some things away and some of those internal processors who have to really think on it a little bit longer. So reach out to Rachel if you have questions. If you um, want to connect about anything that your Realty Leverage can offer, you can reach out to us at info at yrltalent.com. And otherwise, we hope to see you on our next, um, next event. And let us know if you have questions. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye, y'all.